get, uh, get started here. Um, so I guess before I introduce the speaker, are there any general announcements that need to be made? No? <coughs> Going to talk about glacial lake and zoo and, and that's going to be in which it's going to be in where one, is it? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's in one TV one on one. I think that. If anybody wants to visit with Jim while he's here some Thursday for a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, let me know. I'm building a schedule for him. He, he's also here. Could could be here Friday for a little about noon because his plane is out in the Zula Friday. We got him hooked up with Larry, so. Right. But if people want to visit the classes or spend a little time chatting with you, I'll let them know. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, so I, I plan to take Scott uh, to the quarry uh, after your talk. He's going to be welcome to join us with the peers and hopefully be able to see you. I think you are, right? <laughs> Okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Scott Burroughs. Um, he's originally from Illinois, where he did his undergrad at Eastern Illinois Eastern University, yep. right? Um, and then from there, he went on to do his master's and PhD at Washington State University, Pullman. Uh, and I know he did his PhD with John Wolfe, but he also did his mm -hmm. master's with John Wolfe. Um, for those of you who haven't met John Wolfe, he's a, he's a really good researcher, um, very knowledgeable. Uh, and I guess he mostly worked on these low uh, delta 18 uh, of uh, rhyolites, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and now he's the lab manager at the Peter Cooper Geoanalytical Laboratory at WSU. Um, and the geology group here at the Bureau, we've been sending them samples pretty consistently since 2012, I think, something like that. And I personally met Scott for the first time last spring. He was leading uh, the GSA field trip. And, and Bill Bonnick's and John Wolf, and, and that's when I realized that, that um, Scott just wasn't some nerd in a white, white lab coat analyzing samples for us. He's actually really seasoned field geology. So, um, without further ado, I give you uh, Dr. Scott Brooks. Thanks, everybody. So, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about the Snake River Plain rhyolites. First part of the talk uh, is just a pretty picture. That's the wolf man right there who he spoke about, who I now actually work for, so I spent a long time with John. Um, and this is a big rhyolite lava flow, cool rainbow. Um, and these rocks, one thing you'll probably take away, I'll mention over and over again, uh, are homogenous over huge scales. So these can be really difficult to work on because uh, you could grab a piece of this, drive 250 kilometers northeast, pitch it out the window of your truck on the side of the road, and some other poor geologist could come along and pick it up and think it came from the outcrop that it was laying at. Um, so quick overview, I'm going to talk about the background, some characteristics of the rocks. We'll talk about the volcanology, so I'll kind of introduce you to what these rocks look like. They're actually kind of unusual. Um, then a little bit of uh, talk about their morphology. They've interacted with water. Um, this is a separate interaction with water than the oxygen isotope stuff I'll talk about. Get to those details. Then we're going to talk about the extent, how big they are, how they relate to the rocks in Yellowstone, and then I'll hopefully you have enough time to talk about how, uh, at least a couple of models for how they came to be. So and we're going to be talking about, which one's the laser there? We're going to be talking about uh, these rocks here along here. So here's Yellowstone, we're up here right now. Um, and this is the hotspot track, the North American plate trucking along this way, stationary hotspot underneath. Uh, if you believe that model, there's still some debate about it. Uh, I was just speaking earlier, this is the last place in the world you want to investigate plumes. Uh, as you can see, Columbia River basalt's probably related to the plume, so they are, this is all, we like to consider this all one system. Okay, this big basalt outflows at you know, 15, 17 million years, and then the march of rhyolite along this way. Uh, something I leave this figure in for, uh, just so I can trash it, 
these circles, not calderas, this is in 101 geology textbooks all over the world, uh, that there's this march of calderas culminating in Yellowstone. We, there, we don't see any calderas from here back, okay? We don't know how they erupted, they're all buried, the rocks are really weird. Uh, these are what we would call eruptive centers, and even that is a little sketchy. Whether or not this is, should all just be one big red blob that gets younger as you go that way, who knows. But this is a common figure that kind of needs to be expunged from the literature, but we haven't. So we've got the arc. Again, this is another reason it's a terrible place to study hot spots. We've got an arc. We've got the, the bathlith up here. We've got basin range extension. It's a complete bus crash, okay? If you want to study plumes, go to Hawaii. Um, so that's kind of the background. Uh, the rocks mostly I'm going to be talking about are going to be from about 14 and a half million years to 10 million years. And they're Yellowstone analogs, okay? So they're the same kind of thing. As I will point out, though, they are quite different uh, when you get to the details. But we feel that sort of one mechanism started them all. Plate going that way, plume coming up underneath, and it just burned a hole in the crust as it marched along. So here's a map of the rocks to some degree, very generalized geologic map. We're going to be looking at all of this stuff, and I'm going to be referring it as the Central Snake River Plain. And this over here is going to be called the Yellowstone Plateau or Yellowstone Heisey system. Okay, so the younger stuff about zero to six million years in here. Batholith, these pink rocks are going to be real important. Um, there's a little glob of them there, and there's a little glob under some of my symbols here. Their orientation location is quite important to the story. Um, and the batholiths is important to the story. Blue is Columbia River basalts, which way down at the end of the talk will be kind of important. Uh, oxygen isotopes, we'll go through that crash course. Um, and we'll get this diagram again, so I'm not going to rest on it. So, rhyolites in general. Um, these are pyroclastic flow deposits for the most part, the volume, uh, so ignimbrite, salt column, pyroclastic flow deposits. Okay, these are the killer clouds of hot rock that buried Vesuvius. Uh, they're different than the Vesuvian type and the more common types that we know about here uh, in the western United States. They're quite different. And some of those differences are they're really, really toasty. Okay, your average rhyolite should be 750, 800 degrees C. These go up to 1,000, maybe even a bit over 1,000. So they're hot. They're very dry. You don't see any phases that have water in them like biotite or amphibole. Um, and we call them A-type magmas, which is just a classification scheme. Um, they're very densely welded in outcrop. So when you go to your average pyroclastic flow, it's a big kind of fluffy deposit by rock standards. Um, and you can sometimes even, you know, carve out uh, individual pumices. It's fragmented. You can break it apart. These things are dense rock that you need a big hammer to sample, okay, because they are so hot. So they are in place, and then they cook uh, and, and weld in place. Uh, we see these vitrifere. I'm actually kind of going to skip through this so we don't take too long because you're going to see a lot of this as I go. Um, just quick, they're, they're feldspar, quartz, pyroxene, uh, and our accessory phases are zircon and apatite. Um, usually don't have a ton of phenocrysts. You can get up to 20%, but most of them are about 5%. And this is what I was saying earlier. They're monotonous, okay? Uh, Pete Lipman or Wes Hilder is one of the kind of the USGS volcanological gurus. Uh, wrote a paper calling the, uh, the, the presence of monotonous, uh, monotonous intermediates. They're not really intermediate, but um, and basically it's because they're big, huge, boring piles of rock that all look the same. Okay? Uh, I personally think they're quite nice, but uh, that's each to make their own decision. So here's, here's a sort of schematic. Your typical ignimbrite, you have an eruption over here somewhere, the sucker pours down the hill, you can imagine putting a piece of plywood on the ground and dropping flour on it and it goes whoosh, and flows down like a density current. And you end up with a poorly sorted deposit of pumices and ash and just, you know, lithics, various garbage that's just rolled down the hill, they'll thin as they get further away. And maybe if it's hot enough, you'll get what's called a eutaxitic texture. And this is basically everything was these round pumices and chunks, but it was hot enough and dent and heavy enough that it squishes the interior and you'll get welding in the interior. The pumices will go from <laughs> round to flattened, okay, just from under the own weight. This is your typical thing, you know, Italy, Vesuvius, uh, Pinatubo, a recent, well, relatively recent eruption. Um, this is pretty typical. This is what most people think of ignimbrites. 
Up here it is a snake river plain type. Uh, if anybody is into this at all, I, I cannot recommend this paper enough. I don't agree with a lot of the interpretations, but the descriptions are outstanding. Okay, and this it's actually I believe the paper is called SR type ignimbrites. Okay, so snake river type ignimbrites. So we get this uh, sort of typical features are everything is completely obliterated in the center. There are no pumices left. There are no ash shards left. Okay, these things that land at a thousand degrees C and they basically flatten and fold under their own weight um, and all of this texture that may, we don't know if it was there, it's gone. Um, we see a, what's called a basal vitrophere at the bottom and that's just glassy black kind of obsidian, uh, it's not exactly obsidian, sometimes it gets weathered a little bit, uh, but it's got some crystals in it, um, but it'll look like black glassy rock along the base and the top, that's because it's cold in the ground and it's cold in the air compared to the rhyolite, so it gets quenched as it's erupted out and, and you get this, uh, bottom layer and top layer of vitrophere. Uh, these are great for a lot of my work because they're quite pristine relative to the interior so we get good chemistry out of them. You get a lot of uh, flow folding, um, again where it's float, float under its own weight so as it's say it rubs down a valley it'll slump down the sides of the valley you'll get a series of deformation features from just the mass of it compacting. Um, you'll get these big huge folds, reamorphic folds it's called, reamorphism. Um, so these things look like little tiny metamorphic rocks sometimes. They can just be swirled and folded. You'll see pictures. And we get some breaches, uh, breaches and pepperites on the bottom. Pepperites basically say this thing ran over some moisture or whatever and it's, you get a little explosion, small ash particles. Um, and then platy joints, okay, where there's these shear surfaces form uh, joints that are maintained after the fact. Once the thing is completely cooled, you get these joints. Someday I'm going to have a deck made out of them because they just make these perfect thin sheets of pink rhyolite with little crystals in them. They also make terrifying skateboards when you're walking around on tailless slopes. Um, and they, these can actually thin, quite thin, and still be completely welded, which is completely unusual for an ignimbrite. Okay? Something this thin just doesn't have enough thermal mass to weld and, and, and stay, uh, you know, to stay in a coherent piece. Whereas these things are so hot that they, they can be, I've, I've seen them that thick, maybe completely vitrified. Okay, all, still all textures destroyed. So that's your nimbrites. So we'll look at some. This is a typical package. Uh, I just was out here in June with a friend who's gonna start a project out here. The reason this is awesome is because we very rarely see big stacks of them and see the whole units. And so this is an actual soil right down here and then this is the basal ash underneath. So we're actually starting below this and we can see all the way up through this. Uh, and you can see there's several back here. I'll show you some pictures of those rocks. We took a death march up there and went out. Um, but you can see the whole thing. And up here, you know, you can see the joining. You can see the lithophysal cavities. They're just whole, the spherulites and holes up here. Uh, but this is the whole package, basal vitrophere, ash, and even the baked soil underneath. Um, and this is really cool because this is kind of one of the type sections for these rocks. And there's, I guess there's seven ignimbrites in here. Uh, and these, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but they're, they're enormous. Some of these are 1,000 cubic kilometers, uh, dense rock equivalent, okay? So these are easily some of the largest eruptions known to man, um, and there's several of them. So here's one, uh, shade, awesome in desert, so we hide under rocks whenever possible. Uh, so this is this finely laminated ash. This is unusual as well. There's no pumices in this. It's, it's way thicker than it should be for the rest of the ignimbrite, a weird feature we don't really understand. Here's our basal vitrophere clear up here. So this is all fallout, but this thing is so hot up here that that is all ash probably, and it's, it's been welded back to vitrophere, so it looks like obsidian. Uh, all textures are gone, but it, it was probably ash layers. But this puppy was so toasty that it cooked down into the underlying ash. And then we get these, uh, the Swiss cheese horizon we call it. Uh, this is where little nucleation sites, it was wet, and you get these little sphere, spherical things that kind of look like geodes, sort of. They're crystallizing features that are probably happening well after the rhyolite has cooled. And then it goes on up for another 30 meters in this photo. You can't see it up here, and eventually there's an upper vitrophere on the top. Oh, so I kind of gave it away. We'll just leave it. Uh, you can see the rheomorphic folding here, okay? This isn't an ignimbrite, this is not a lava. This thing was emplaced as a, pat, a sheet, okay? But under its own heat and weight, we've got these big folds, 
big folds here. You see sheath folds that come out at you. Um, just some really amazing metamorphic textures and a, and a student, um, Brainy, that, that 2008 paper, one of his students actually treated a, one of these units like you would treat a metamorphic or a structural project and went out and took 47 million striking dips and you know wandered around this thing and, and did a structural analysis of a reamorphic membrane. It was pretty cool. You could see, he could see these deformation of it slumping. He could see deformation traction from the emplacement and he could see deformation from collapsing. And he did it just like a metamorphic, like stage one, stage two, and you could see them overprinting each other. I don't envy him um, in terms of spending whatever 2,000 striking dips in a two square mile area it would have been pretty tough. Okay, so now lava flows. So there are large lava flows out here in the central Snake River Plain. In fact, the largest lava flow known to man is out here. Um, and in fact, nobody believed they were lavas because they were too dang big, okay? And so they, they spent years, a lot of the mappers called them large volume lava-like ignimbrites without calderas which is, you're really struggling not to call them a lava at that point. Uh, but Bill Bonickson, one of my mentors, finally convinced everybody they really are. And when you see all the features in, in, in place, you can, you can believe it. So the lavas are much thicker. They often have these uh, upper vitrophers and basal vitrophers as well, same reason. Um, they'll be a lot thicker usually, but not always. Um, and they'll have big columnar joints. Uh, they'll have the same kind of folding features and platy joints at the tops. They tend to be a little lumpier. Um, but for years and to this day, there are units out there that we do not know whether they're an ignimbrite or a lava. We still can't tell because without seeing all of the features, you can't make a call. So I'll show you pictures of this. This is a frontal breccia or marginal breccia where this thing is breaking up as it's flowing. Your typical lava is like what's going on in St. Helens right now. They look like this, okay? It's a dome. Toothpaste squeezing out of a tube, piling up. You might get some block and ash flows on the sides as it collapses a little bit. Uh, two kilometers across is a big one. You know, maybe these coolies are bigger where they're erupting down a side of a volcano or something. Here, greater than or equal to 30 kilometers, okay? So St. Helens Dome right now is a half a cubic kilometer size lump. Uh, the smallest one of these units that I can think of is 10 cubic kilometers. So the smallest lava I have seen out there is bigger than the Pinatubo eruption uh, and 10 times bigger than St. Helens, okay? And it's a lava. So it was hard for people to believe that these things could flow because rhyolite's really viscous. Uh, but they do. And you give them enough time, you keep the hot, the middle of it hot, you thicken it up, it'll flow. Okay, so here's a picture, some cool stuff. This we actually did visit on the field trip. Uh, this is a Jump Creek rhyolite. You can see this kind of hummocky look to it. Uh, out here is a marginal breccia, which we'll zoom in on. Not just a marginal breccia, the craziest breccia on earth. Um, but you can kind of get a sense that it's not that layer cake like you were seeing in the ignimbrites. But again, it's not always that trivial. And so this is a basal. Um, uh, I wonder if I skipped that slide. I hope I didn't. Uh, this is a uh, basal um, breccia, okay, and vitrophere, and this is a little ash, probably an ash that erupted, you know, as the thing was getting started, it was spewing out some ash, maybe, you know, free magnetism or whatever, laid this thin layer of ash down. But you can see soft sediment deformation around these blocks, okay, all these blocks of vitrophere. So what's happening here is as this lava is marching along, the top of it's cold and the sides and the bottom are cold, everything's breaking up, falling off the front of it. Uh, making a pile and then the lava rolls over that, okay? And you end up with these basal breaches. So you see these also in the, the nimbrites, but they're usually much more limited and they're where the thing kind of flowed, after, you know, reamorphically flowed in a small space. So we rarely see big, well-developed breaches like this. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. It just, you can see, oh, I see what's going on. Um, and then again, paleosol with this thing rolled over it. And it cooked, you know, hot enough to cook this to oxidize it. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is the road crop. This outcrop, I've had posters and uh, with it on there, volcanology stuff, and I'll get random strangers walking up, be like, "Oh, you want to talk about the rhyolites?" Like, no, I don't. I'm a, I'm a mineral geologist in Winnemucca. I drive through from Boise to Winnemucca all the time, and I drive past this. What the hell is that? Because when you're going 60 miles an hour by it, it looks you like, is that metamorphic? What is that thing? And you can see it's complete chaos. And 
the term now in the literature finally is chaotic megabrecha. And so what this is, is it's the front of this puppy has rolled over down into a creek bed or over a, a waterfall or a slope and it's breaking up and smashing into the sediments. This thing, imagine this sucker is 100 meters thick at this point. Um, it's rolling over and smashing down into this and these are sediments. This is ash rich stuff, so you know, this hot rhyolite's hitting the water and causing ash explosions. Um, those, the ashes are sometimes oxidized. These are oxidized soils and sediments that are getting tore up and ground up into this thing. You think of a snow plow as it goes along and how the stuff gets torn up in the front of it. Um, this thing is, I call it the bulldozer outcrop because this thing is dozing down into this. And I always take and see students for scale there. So this is, I think, aptly called a mega breccia. Um, right here this is my favorite pod of conglomerate. It's a class supported conglomerate that got ground up, or not ground up, but scooped up in this thing. And it's lovely when you've been talking about volcanology the whole time and talking about rhyolite lava flows and, and the first student who wanders past and is like, and all these perfectly round, it looks like a stream deposit, because it is a stream deposit, but it's in the middle of this rhyolite lava flow. And then of course you're like, oh yeah, it's common for conglomerates to form in the middle of the rhyolite lava flows. Um, so chaotic mega breaches. So these things are just bulldozers as they, they flow. Oh, a little too fast. So this is uh, my originally named black and red breccia. Okay, and so this stuff is just uh, ash rich particles is the matrix. You got blocks of vitrofer in there. I've analyzed this with a microprobe. Um, also what's cool about this is I call it also a fractal breccia because at this scale and even to the size of this room scale, there'll be big boulders in it and then you slice that into a thin section, it looks exactly the same. So the particle size, it's very poorly sorted. It goes all the way down. And this is just oxidized material. Uh, maybe got a little, it's a little moist, maybe it got more air. Um, and it's just, but you can analyze with the microprobe and it's the same. It is identical in major element space. There is no difference between the red and the black. Uh, these are common at the tops where you've got oxygen to oxidize them. So this is a field characteristic that we see that tells us we're in the top. Usually, they can form in the bottoms. This is that breccia that I was talking about forming at the front end of this thing. This one's probably gray instead of black because it's colder. Um, didn't oxidize because this was flowing into a, a paleo lake, Idaho. Okay, so there's a big lake in the western Snake River Plain at this time. And these things all flowed down the slope into this. And this one probably was interacting either with groundwater or perhaps standing water. But this is just ashy matrix uh, with these, you know, that's a cobble that fell out of this thing. You can see these big blocks of vitrofer. Again, that's the front breaking up, all of that stuff. And if you were to drill in there 100 yards, there's probably stony, hard, real rhyolite in the middle. And somebody actually, probably someone who was slightly unhinged, drilled a hole through this thing uh, like, a, like a mine tunnel, but there's nothing to mine. And it's got a big chimney hole in it. I don't know, if it, we don't know when it was done. We just found it a few years ago. Uh, but it's really neat, thankfully, the unhinged person drilled a meaningless tunnel in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's like from here to that door and, you know, that big. But you can see the inside of it fresh and it's really kind of cool. So thanks, a strange person. There's a geocache in there too, which I imagine if you didn't know it was there, it'd be hard to find. So that's just that frontal breccia, and you can see the scale of these things. And we also were discussing, this looks just like a block and ash flow, that what we'd normally call a block and ash flow in volcanology, because it is. There's no fundamental difference between a dome being built and collapsing and this big lava blob moving along and collapsing. So if you find this in the field, you know, there's no way to tell unless you can see more of it. Uh, we're gonna kind of skip over this uh, for the most part, but I just wanted to show you, this is uh, inverted topography, so to speak. So this lava erupted here, backfilled up a valley, and then flowed out this way, which downhill is out that way. Boise would be up here in the ceiling somewhere. And it flowed out this way and filled this paleo valley. Of course, this rhyolite was really tough stuff, and once it filled in the stream, the stream couldn't go through here. So Wilson Creek and Reynolds Creek reestablished themselves on both sides. And now you can actually see this, you know, Paleo Valley, basically. And presumably these are little, you know, side valleys coming in where the rhyolite was um, frozen up. It sits right on Bathworth granite here. Okay, so what are the implications? 
Uh, there's virtually no pumice in the SRP. This isn't really an MK, it's more of an op observation. Um, they are really well sorted for ignimbrites. Okay, there's no large particles, which by definition then makes them pretty well sorted. Uh, and they represent larger than normal bubbles. When you look at the bubbles, and you know, pumice is a basically rhyolite froth. And when you look at the bubbles, the bubbles are great big bubbles and they're long, elongated things. You don't see, you would never see like a pumice that you would, you know, buy a pumice stone to wash your tub with. Uh, there's no lithics in the SRP. They're like hen's teeth, they're super rare. You never see pieces of the vent or pieces of the basement terrain that it was running over. And you think of violent explosion, you would have broken up bits of rock. So the idea is that there's little vent or paleo surface erosion, and it maybe means because these things are so, they're low viscosity because they're really hot, and they're actually sticking and being deposited as, a pet, as opposed to scouring the surface that they go across. It also makes it difficult to say there's calderas. You would expect these huge volume rhyolites would have some big caldera out there, but if there's a caldera collapse forming, you would expect to see these mega breaches somewhere, you would expect to see big lithics in the rocks, you don't see that anywhere and maybe they're fish are fed, we don't really know. The, the, the calderas are out there underneath mm, a kilometer of basalt and another couple kilometers of rhyolite. We drilled, they, they had a big drilling program. They drilled through, uh, we spent a lot of money on this hole. They drilled through like uh, 500 meters of basalt and hit rhyolite and drilled 7,000 feet through the rhyolite, I think. and it was all one unit. So we analyzed it and you put it on a plot and it's just boop, it's all one thing. It's gotta be caldera fill or fissure fill or something, but it was the most useless drill hole. And you know, cause you're expecting like, what's the stratigraphy? What's the, what have we found? It's like, oh, we just drilled 5,000 feet of the same exact stuff. Uh, and it was, I mean, it could have been an analytical standard. It was so similar. Um, Lava-like facies, okay, we don't really need it. They're the fine grain and usually thick ashes. This is all high temperature. So really high mass flux, lots of material coming out, really hot. That's the only way you can keep it that hot. Um, and then you get this fine grained, unusually thick ashes. It's either probably maybe free atom magnetism. And remember, there was probably a big lake out here. I mean, it, there should have been at that time. Um, so maybe these things are erupting through water or at the very least shallow groundwater and getting a lot of explosion, uh, explosive stuff. And they're hot and dry, right? So they don't have a lot of their own volatiles. Um, <coughs> so perhaps that's, you know, this pulsing volatile exolution, you get a blast, a blast, a blast. Um, again, a lot of that speculation. Okay, so now we're going to go to the geochemistry. It looks like I'm in good shape here. So the geochemistry, um, how did these things come to be? Uh, first, to talk about what I worked out, I need to give you a, a, a crash course in oxygen isotopes. So oxygen isotopes, there's oxygen 16, 17, and 18. Anybody who's not familiar with isotopes, that's just the same number of protons and electrons, so it's chemically the same, differing number of neutrons. So it weighs a little different, okay, in the nucleus. So 16, 17, and 18 are the three isotopes. So the, these are the percentages of the isotopes. So you can see that 17, there's hardly any. Um, so 18 is pretty minor. And then you know, what we're breathing is 99.7% uh, 16. So these are all chemically the same. So they should behave the same. Um, and these are also stable isotopes. So most of you, you know, radiometric dating, you've heard of that, they decay, et cetera. They go from one isotope to a different one. Uh, this doesn't happen. So this ratio, if you were to grind up the solar system and analyze it in my lab, a uh, small aliquot presumably, um, it should be in that ratio. That has not changed since the formation of the solar system, okay? So that's another nice thing. It doesn't change through time. Um, stable isotopes, so they don't fractionate because of decay, but they can be fractionated by natural processes, and it's all down to mass, okay? It's kinetic energy. So this dude is heavier than that dude. So processes that favor light things are gonna favor the 16. Processes that favor heavy things are gonna favor the 18. So for instance, condensation. You go from a, a gas to a liquid, the heavy isotope is gonna prefer that liquid, okay? So in the course of, of natural processes, we can actually change these, the ratio. Um, and this is not just used for rocks. This is actually mostly used for climate studies. Um, they use it for 
uh, ocean uh, temperature studies, ice core studies. Uh, it's really big in paleoclimatology because, and this is important for us to some degree, the effect of those fractionations, the effect of the changes in the isotope ratio are often a function of temperature. So if you can measure the isotope ratio and you know something about the rock, you can calculate the temperature. So you can take limestone, for instance, and calculate the temperature of the ocean that it came from, which is really important for climate studies. For us, the key is we want that to go away. Uh, so actually, at very high temperatures, the fractionation factors get very small. Okay? When you're at 700 degrees C, the difference between this and this isn't enough for those vibra you know, chaotically vibrating molecules. So uh, at high temperatures, you don't get a lot of fractionation, and that's important because we're talking about magmatic stuff. And then this is just a standard, basically sample minus standard divided by standard times uh, 10 to the third. We do that so that we're not, you know, if I was like, so my rocks had a 0.99972 ratio and this other rock had a 0.99962 ratio, I just say, mine was one per mil, this one was two per mil. Okay, so that's the only reason we do this. Vismo is ocean water. It's literally a bucket of water that some dude pulled out of the ocean. Uh, I think the Mediterranean Sea. Um, we don't use it specifically, but there is some Vismo out there. Um, and uh, to, as a standard. Oceans buffer oxygen really good, so if you pick up some water out of the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean, they're all going to be within a half or per mil of zero. So that's why they use it as a standard. And, almost forgot, that's why I have the animation, rocks are 50% oxygen, okay? So this is not a trace element. We're not talking about the borium tedium ratios in, a, in you know, trace elements. We're talking about half the rock. Okay, so you can't accidentally, you know, like if you're looking at lead isotopes and you throw a little piece of galena into your mix, it can radically change, you know, you can have a ton of rock and a little tiny piece of lead and it will radically change the, the, the ratios or the, the, the analysis you do. They're half oxygen, so it's really tough to move this around. This ratio should stay similar. And thankfully it does. Okay, so this is all igneous rocks on Earth are in this little narrow range right here, okay, from about 5 to 10 per mil. Most of them are 5 to about 7 per mil, okay. Um, metamorphic rocks can have a wide range because of interacting with a bunch of this other stuff. Carbonate, because it's a low temperature thing, remember that fractionation factor can get large at low temperatures. Um, but igneous rocks are here. And I think you probably already figured out there's one reservoir on this map or on this graph that is really different from everything else, and that's meteoric water, okay? Water that fell from the sky. And the reason why, and so this makes it a good tool, this very, very different than this. And so it doesn't take much of this added to this to change that oxygen isotope ratio. And the reason, simple hydrologic cycle, okay? So remember, light isotopes fractionate when you evaporate things. Heavy isotopes fractionate when you condense things. Well, they both fractionate. Heavy prefers condensation, light prefers evaporation. So you start with zero, you evaporate some, your clouds are now negative 10. Come over here, you rain out some, so that rain is still less than this, but it's a little higher in the cloud. Then we go, so now our vapor is 15, negative 15 per mil, et cetera, et cetera. The more times you do this, for instance, here in uh, Butte, the atmospheric oxygen or water. New York water vapor is actually quite a bit lower than it is in Seattle because you've had the Cascade rain cycle and the Rocky Mountain rain cycle and the next rain cycle. So you can actually see that um, fractionation. So New York water, um, again, goes from zero to negative 40. So it's, a, it's really characteristic. It's a good fingerprint for New York water and that's why we use it. Okay, finally back to this diagram. So these are the oxygen isotopes. Uh, the takeaway here is these orange ones, mildly depleted. So this is, when I say depleted, it's depleted in 18. Um, so it's a lower value than you would expect. Um, enriched in 16. This normal, this very mildly depleted. These here are starting to get pretty depleted from yellow on down. So I think you can take away something right away. First oxygen isotopes in, in, in rhyolites were actually described here, low oxygen. So meteoric water interaction is described up here. And they, they had a pretty good handle on how, what was happening, they thought. But you see, there's a lot of normal rocks in here. And down here, it's all blue, okay? These red ones are Western Sacred Plain. Those are a separate 
um, entity. They are not hotspot related exactly. Um, so they're the only normal ones out here. Every single sample I picked up was low. I actually thought my instrument wasn't working when I was working on my master's degree because I didn't get any normal values and I thought things were broken. CSRP, okay, this is a CSRP OI helium bolt. That's just some circles that were on that first map. Uh, 14 and a half, six, greater than 15,000 cubic kilometers. So there's about 15,000 cubic kilometers mappable here, okay? We figure there's probably double that that you can't actually go sample because remember I told you it's all buried. About 9,000 here at Yellowstone. Um, and a lot of this is uh, not dense rock equivalent, it's actually the outcrop equivalent. Um, so there's even a little less if you compare apples to apples. Um, zero to six, some fundamental differences, I'm gonna burn through this, but you see that this line corresponds to right here. Iron drops, temperature drops, eruption frequency drops. So something fundamental is happening between the Heise Center and what's what we call the Twin Falls, but the latest CSRP and the earliest Yellowstone, there's something different, okay? And there's many other changes, morphology, etc. So to make these rocks, we gotta come up with some, control, some things that we have to include in our model that have to be satisfied in any model that does this. Because remember, again, 50% oxygen, so you have to take in oxygen, you can't ignore it. Um, they require a meteoric hydrothermally altered source, okay? So, so we're not putting rainwater in our magma. What we're doing is we're boiling our source rocks, okay? So at Yellowstone, somewhere down deep in Yellowstone, it's really hot, all that water, snow, and ice, it's, it's getting boiled through those rocks, and the water percolates down, and it'll swap in oxygen with the water, will swap with the rock. You know, you're dissolving the rocks, you're carrying things around, reprecipitating them and you're swapping out this oxygen. So you take a normal rock and you boil it long enough. And by boil, it's not really boiling because we're talking like 400 degrees C here. It's not really water at that point anymore, but uh, some crazy vapor stuff. Uh, you boil these rocks and eventually the oxygen signature of the rock goes down and then you melt that to make your rhyolite, okay? You cannot put the water in the magma. Water is cold, magma hot. Water, surface pressure, magma, static pressure. Saturation issues. There's all kinds of reasons you cannot get the water into the rock um, in any meaningful amount. So it has to be a meteoric hydrothermally altered source, okay? So Old Faithful kind of thing, or the roots of Old Faithful. You also can't forget boiling water takes a lot of energy. Okay? And so you need the heat required to melt the rocks, which is roughly this. I did a few calculations on this, 1,700 joules per gram. So to make a gram of rhyolite, you need 1,700 joules. The heat required for hydrothermal alteration at these temperatures is similar to that required to make a magma. Okay? So to take water from room temperature, because it's meteoric, remember, it was cold when it fell, to 400 degrees C requires an enormous amount of energy. So you can't forget that you need that heat somewhere in the system at some time. And a lot of models have forgotten that. So I did this thing, we're not gonna go into great detail on this, but it's just a hypothetical mixture basically. We decided to take the lowest rock in the two systems, Yellowstone and Central Snake River Plain, lowest delta 18 rock, call it one end member, and the highest and call it another end member. And we decided to mix the two um, in a hypothetical, we're not in any way implying this is happening in nature. It's just a way to get a handle on the amount of depletion that you see. You mix the two, you get a, 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 a basically a mixing line, simple mixing line, and then we multiply that out by volume because a really low delta 18 rock that's a small lava flow doesn't have as much of our low part in member as a huge ignimbrite that's moderately low, okay? So maybe I got 10 kilometers in this and I got 1,000 kilometers in that, well, all of this is low, but half of that's low. This one has more low in it. So we did this volume weighted depletion index. So it's just a, a basically a way to get a handle on how much depletion is going on in a particular unit or a particular volcanic field. And we use Huckleberry Ridge Tuff, which is the big dog eruption at Yellowstone, and then Cougar Point Tuff 12, which is another big dog in the uh, Central Snake River Plain. So two models. These, one was proposed before uh, before I started working in the second one, that's how I got my PhD, basically. First one, magmatic cannibalism, okay? So the idea here is at a place like Yellowstone, 
you got a big normal body of magma that's melted from some normal source rock. It sits there. It boils its own roof and its juices, okay, it alters that. You erupt some, some units out, so say the first eruption should be normal. You erupt it out. It lands in the caldera. It gets boiled, okay? And then subsequent eruptions melt, partially melt or fully melt, <coughs> that boiled rhyolite. So it's cannibalism. It's eating itself. It really should be called autophagy. Cannibalism eating people of your own species. Autophagy is eating yourself. So, but anyway, cannibalism sounds better. Um, so basically, you start with a normal system. The heat, everything is supplied by this normal system that then boils itself and then eats itself, and you end up erupting subsequently lower and lower oxygen isotope units. The other option is there was something down there to begin with that got melted. And people that give away the talk, this, this is my idea. Um, they didn't like it because they're like, well, that's a coincidence. Yes, it is a coincidence, but hey, you know. Um, so those are the two models. The idea is that there was something already in the crust, okay, that had been hydrothermally altered at some point prior to the Yellowstone hotspot arriving on the scene. And that's not hard to believe. The crust is pretty complicated around here, okay? So this comes back to what I was saying. So there's this line down here of these Eocene uh, plutonic rocks and some Eocene um, volcanics. So this is another, just to show you, there's fundamentally something different. Yellow, or uh, red is Yellowstone, green is the Snake River Plain, okay? There is not a single normal unit. I analyzed 50 some, 57 now, and we have not found one that is normal. Um, and notice the extreme degree of depletion. The other thing is, these are 40% of the volume of these big, large volume ignimbrites, Huckleberry Ridge, Mesa Falls. Those are huge ignimbrites, they're normal. Everything else are these little post caldera collapse lavas that are low at Yellowstone. These lavas, ignimbrites, everything. This cougar point, this lowest one is a huge ignimbrite, okay? So it's fundamentally different. Okay, so magnetic cannibalism, let's put our parameters that we said we have to satisfy. So you need, what's the volume weighted depletion index? So how depleted, how much depleted material do you need? So if you, your volume weighted average is about 5.3 per mil, so slightly depleted, remember six, seven should be what we're at, that comes out to about 18% of the overall volume, okay? If we take our hypothetical end member, we need about 18% of it, and we need about 82% of our normal stuff. Uh, water rock ratio, that's just how much water you need to get it there, okay? So if you, to boil that much rock properly and alter it, you need about 500 joules per gram, give or take. Uh, so that's 10 to 30 percent, so a third, maybe a tenth of the, pro of the, the um, melting heat, okay? So if I've got a system, I need an extra 10 percent of heat to make Yellowstone. Because remember, you have to boil those rocks. You can't just make magnets. You have to boil the rocks. This is if it's all happening with one system. Early erupted products are normal. It's what we'd expect, right? You start with normal and you progressively alter it. And it's only found in these post-caldera collapse lavas where things have fallen down into the hole and, and are more closer to the magma. Seems to work. Okay, so this is just a simple model. I basically already described it. The idea is normal, you erupt a normal rock, you start boiling it, you erupt another one on top of it. This is a complicated model for Heise, but the idea started normal, boil, boil, boil. Finally, you get over here and you start uh, tapping into this boiled stuff and things start going down. So notice how it's slowly getting lower and lower. And then you melt a bunch of Kilgore Tuff and you have this low delta 18 membrane. I love how this diagram, uh, where is it? Uh, is Kilgore Tuff magma is homogenized because that's trivial in 2,000 cubic kilometers of viscous fluid. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we just stirred it up. Um, so here's the, oxygen pattern and you can see that kind of cyclic pattern so things move you know they kind of come back up to normal and then the next caldera you, you know you kind of got this marching pattern and I'll this is just a little harping I'll show this is the Cougar Point CSRP looks really similar it's almost identical I'll come back to that um, for the pre-existing source what we would propose for CSRP you have a volume weighted delta 18 of 2.4 
Okay, that's that volume weighted is lower than 99% of the rocks at Yellowstone, any single rock. So that's 8,000 cubic kilometers of low delta 18 end member, our fake end member that we talked about. So we need about as much as Yellowstone of the low end member to make the CSRP. Um, well, that corresponds to approximately doubling the heat. Okay, so the amount of heat you need in that system to make the magma now needs to be twice as much just because of the oxygen isotope data uh, because you've got to boil that rock. So now we need twice as much heat. Uh, strong depletion is found in all of uh, the products. There's no like marching cycle despite that diagram. And this basically says to me that it's got to be from a prior thermal event. Um, you're implying if you didn't do the alteration, there'd be 60,000 cubic kilometers of rock right there in the Snake River Plain. It's already enough. Um, so the idea is that it kind of had to be there before. There had to be a pre-existing heat source. And finally, this just so that's my stuff on the same scale, time scale, and then this is my actual data. To be fair to the authors of those previous graphs, they did not have all of this, but. I still feel like they pretty picked. And now if you take that diagram, that's Yellowstone, that's Heise, and look, it's exactly the same. Oh wait, no, maybe it goes up at the beginning and then down. Or does it go down at the beginning? There's no pattern, okay? They just kind of, they said, oh, Cougar Point tough, that's all those rock. Well, they didn't get the timing right. And so you can tell that there is complete carnage in that pattern. But if you take enough data points out of there, you can get a really nice correlation. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so, and another, just another quick piece of evidence. Look, there's a huge pile of rhyolite. It's all normal. There's no marching pattern of anything. This is, uh, this is Cougar Point. Oh, no, this is Black Rock. So this is an amazing exposure. Um, and then also, if you take that fraction, 18% at Yellowstone, if you take the same model that applies to Yellowstone and apply it to here, we're only seeing a fifth of the rhyolite here. So there's another, what? I don't know, 100,000 cubic kilometers we're missing. Again, I think we would have found it by now or seen it in geophysical surveys. Uh, just another one of those. So last, we're almost there. Is this plausible, okay? Is a pre-existing source plausible? So I can, I can just magic up Harry Potter style a pre-existing source. It's down there, we don't know what it is. Is there any plausible source and what is it? And so what is it? Is there enough of it and is it suitable for rhyolite? So slightly different map, green, Idaho batholith. And this is a map from uh, Chris and Taylor, I think, or Taylor, uh, Chris and Fleck. These are giant caldera roots, okay? These are the Eocene volcanics, which are the roots of caldera systems. Like Yellowstone, we got a bunch of boiling water. And these are, these zones are, are hydrothermally altered, okay? So this is altered, so these are Eocene rocks. This is altered uh, Cretaceous rock. Um, that's, why am I doing it, I forgot. So these are big zones. This is 20 miles across. These are huge zones, okay, of altered material that happened during the Eocene volcanism. This is Lake City. It's not Eocene, but it's a big caldera that one of my advisors studied quite thoroughly. And this is just a, a shaded map of um, the oxygen isotopes. And if you take the, you know, this 40% here, that's negative one per mil, less than negative one per mil. So there is a huge volume of low delta 18 material in this now that's been altered during these uh, caldera forming events. 86% is less than five per mil. So 86% of this, these things are suitable delta 18 for us. So they, they're, they're oxygen fits. You do the math, each one of these puppies is thousands of cubic kilometers of material. So it's sufficient. Is it in the right place? Yeah, at that time, the battle has come up several kilometers since Snake River Plain time. So these things are at the surface now, but they were down there and this, Snake River Plains right here. They were down there and the Snake River Plain is sagged, so they're probably still down there. And if we go back, notice our low delta 18 province, spatially coincident. There's not hardly any of that stuff out here towards Yellowstone. Coincidence, yeah, circumstantial evidence. I will not win in court. Uh, so are they chemically suitable? So one thing is that the, a lot of the models used um, Lithospheric sources for the basalts in the Snake River Plains. So if you go to Craters of the Moon, pick up a basalt, typical in geochemistry and modeling, you want to go from primitive to evolved, so you'll go pick up the basalt in your area, you'll pick up some rhyolite in your area, and you'll try and draw a line between those two. 
You know, the basalt's the primitive stuff, the rhyolite is the, you know, what it's evolved to through fractionation processes, et cetera. Well, all of the basalts that are on the surface right now are the post-hotspot basalts. They erupted millions of years after the hotspot had already gone through, for the most part. Not all of them. Uh, and they've interacted with a lot of crust. Okay, so they are not primitive basalts by any stretch of the imagination, and they may even be subcontinental generated, so they're not even plume basalts. But there is a source of plume basalts, the actual hot spot plume basalts, mantle basalts. It's a pretty good source, about 300,000 cubic kilometers of it in Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. It's called the Columbia River Basalt Group, okay? And the most primitive basalts have been well demonstrated to represent deep mantle material. So instead of modeling with these things, we started modeling with these. Surprised nobody had done it before. They're, they don't, they're not exposed in the, in the CSRP, but they have to be there. They're the heat source, so they're down in the crust, deep down in the crust. They just never made it out. So we got some borium tedium ratios. So I got uh, neodymium versus strontium isotopes. Okay, this is all my data, the, the green stuff. I simultaneously, or not simultaneously, single-handedly quadrupled the amount of this isotope data in the Stanker reporting. For some reason, nobody really did it. Uh, not all of this other data is from the literature, but these are CRBs, and these are mixing lines, okay? Now you can see why if we start here, we need to add a whole lot more of this stuff to get clear over here, okay? Whereas here, we only need a little bit to force it this way, okay? So instead of saying, oh, we need 70% basalt, to make your mix, which is not chemically or physically possible. Now we're in the range of, you know, each one of these is 10 or five, I can't remember. We're in the range of 10, 10 to 30% basalt. Okay, so neodymium versus strontium. Neodymium versus lead, I'm gonna stop. Neodymium versus oxygen. Strontium versus oxygen. Oh, there's one more. And trace elements, okay? Simultaneously solved four isotope systems and some trace elements. And then the thing I'm most proud about of this diagram is all of these lines are the same pairs of samples, okay? So I didn't go through here and be like, okay, to make strontium match, if I pick this one and I pick that one, it works. But to make neodymium match, I need to pick that one. These are real samples picked off, off the ground by real human beings, and they're all those lines are the same pairs. And I don't know of any other isotope paper that has solved four isotope systems with six samples, uh, and it works. So to me, that's a pretty strong case that if you really went looking, uh, you could definitely flesh this model out, so. And uh, I think, well, summary. So CSRP rhyolites, they can't be formed by cannibalism. It just can't happen. Pre-existing hydrothermally altered source is necessary, okay? The opposite is true for Yellowstone. Yellowstone cannot be, I mean, there may be some pre-existing stuff down in there, but that's not the dominant mechanism, and vice versa. There could have been some cannibalism going on in the CSRP, but it was drowned out by the pre-existing source. Altered source is necessary, uh, so you have to have that, and then Eocene granitic crust um, is abundant, it's chemically and spatially suitable. Uh, so we feel that there are two models. And it's a weird coincidence that they're both on the same hot sock track, but I think the evidence makes it impossible otherwise. Okay, we'll take a nap. Or questions if you have any. Yes, and it's an exposure problem. There's a huge area missing. Come on, let's go back to the good one. It's here somewhere. Um, and it's another reason why I don't like those marching calderas. Yeah, so this is all the rhyolite mapped, right? And you put a call or eruptive center here, and you say, look, all this rhyolite makes this huge eruptive center. They've got a huge eruptive center up here. It's called the peekaboo. And you know what that's based on? These little slots of rhyolite in here and here. Don't know. The, the crust fundamentally changes here. There's maybe the craton is thinning out here. Uh, but to me, you know, the, the, the people who work on these rocks are, oh, they're buried. They're, they're buried. You don't have the big canyons. That's the other thing. The, the huge, you do have some canyons, but the basalt has got them buried to the point where you don't see them. 
So they would maintain, oh, it's all under there. But I would maintain, look at all this stuff that's outside the plane that we can see. Where is it over here? I don't know. So I personally feel like there was a hiatus in volcanism. Maybe the crust is too refractory here. Um, maybe the craton is thinning and it's, your magmas aren't in contact with the suitable source stuff. Um, that's a speculation, totally. But to me, it adds a little bit more weight to the idea that it's not such a huge coincidence that maybe there is a fundamental difference between this and this, because there is a big freaking gap in between them. I thought the explanation was a lot simpler that the government just wouldn't let you sample the data. There is, actually, to some degree, there is, yeah, because the INEAL, yeah. There is some sampling problems, but there's some really good boreholes uh, that INEAL drilled, and then there's some stuff that some petroleum company tried to get out there. They thought that the inner beds, they thought there might be inner bed uh, petroleum resources between the basalts. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's two things. One, maybe it's not there at all because you don't see it out here to the same degree. And then two, there is like two kilometers or three kilometers of basalt stacked up on that. Um, and they just never drilled down it. Yeah? So how do you envision this whole belt of these Uh, the only thing I just extrapolate across, I'd say actually most of it is now on the surface in the form of rhyolites, <laughs> but that's probably not what you're asking. Um, so there is a little bit down here, you've got some down in here, so I kind of feel that this is kind of a belt there. From some of the maps we were looking at in your office, there it appears there might be something like that, right? Is that about right? Uh, yeah. Oh, I guess I'm over here. Um, I, unfortunately, for some reason, I feel bad since I'm in Montana, but my GS, GIS, I'm not a GIS person, and I left Montana off because I think I was using a smaller map for whatever I built this for the first time. And I was looking at it before I came up. Oh, left Montana off. That's kind of a, oops. Um, so I kind of, you know, just based on the exposure, I kind of feel like they crop out through here. And there is actually one, it's called Rough Mountain, that's mapped as Cretaceous here, but it's easy. So, and then I would maintain this, the crust is sagged, okay? So we've placed 10 kilometers of new crust under, this, under the hot spot in the form of basalt sills and things. You can see it in geophysical uh, data. So the crust is actually sagged there. So what's at the surface now is probably, if, if nothing had ever sagged, would be whatever, t seven, eight kilometers tall mountains. Uh, or well, they'd erode off, but you know what I mean. This stuff is now probably um, 10 kilometers down. Would be my guess. Uh -huh. Does it have to be altered the source? Yes. Anything that was in the anything that was in contact with those um, Eocene rocks. The nice thing about the Eocene rocks is there are these A-type granites. They're very crustal in nature, so their isotopes are very crustal, which we need for that. So if you take, if you just take a straight Idaho batholith rock, which are a little bit more, we call them I types, but they're going to have more primitive isotopes, makes it a lot harder. So having the Eocene makes those the last few slides that I threw makes it a lot easier. The Eocene volcanics are perfectly suitable as well if they got buried in there. Stymied virtually everybody who I give this talk to, and the reason why is it's exchange. You don't actually have to make the rocks wet. You can dehydrate them in a later thing. It's oxygen exchange. The actual water to rock ratios to do that alteration are, are up to one or two. So the water just has to pass through the rock. And at those high temperatures, you're literally doing oxygen exchange. So there is, and then the other problem is, it's very, there's very little, uh, th these things are so big and over so, such large areas that you think about if you have a caldera, let's say, and you want to map it, uh, you can walk around and find, oh, here's the alteration zone and this is enriched in molybdenum or gold or whatever, but if you've got a zone that's hydrothermally altered uh, to a large degree and you melt the whole thing, it turns back into what it was to begin with, right? You, the, 
high molybdenum over here means there's a low molybdenum rock over here where that molybdenum came for. So you're actually basically grinding it all back up to, to produce these huge units. Um, so we, we thought about that. We, try, we thought like we need to talk to the mining industry and figure out what chemical tracer will tell us hydrothermal alteration. And then we looked and looked and looked and there was nothing. We couldn't figure out why, how it doesn't, you can plot delta 18 against anything. And so the idea is that there's some very, very altered zones, but there's also some not so altered zones. And when you mix that all back together, you've got a granitic uh, flavor of rock. And so they might have been a little bit more hydrous um, than you would expect, but that just makes them easier to melt, which also maybe they're preferentially melting those altered stuff. Um, it is a bit of a paradox, though. I, 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 we, I've never come to a like, ha, got it, that's why they're dry. Um, but you could dehydrate these things, you know, the heat before they're even produced could be dehydrating the source rock before the magma's even created. Well, and they were hydrothermally altered, and they'd be even melt the floor if you got unusually Yeah, right. And it's, again, I think it's a, I think it's a, this bulk average. Um, the reason, you know, if you looked at those zones that I was showed you, maybe there's this, no. You look at the zones, uh, the, the altered batholithic zones, um, the center of those things is negative 10 or negative 12 per mil, and it just grades out to normal. And if you take that and average it, the stuff that's barely altered at all could be, you know, responsible for this more, uh, it's not as wet, it's, it's a lot hotter. Again, the, the, the scale of this, a lot of people don't really ha have a hard time wrapping their mind around. It's uh, the size of Belgium. My field area was the size of Belgium, hence all the pictures of the motorcycle, because uh, mm -hmm. it would have been tough to sample otherwise. Um, it's just an enormous area, and I think a lot of it is, and again, they're monotonous. I think it's the same process operating on similar rocks, and so you just end up with these big homogenized blobs. That's, again, there, this could be proven wrong, but we, uh, we've tried, we, we've literally tried most every ore, ore element um, to see if it correlates with anything, and we have, it's a shotgun for everything, major elements, minor elements, which makes it pretty difficult. But, and the, the thing is, the other thing, and this is punting for sure, but the cannibalism model has the same exact problem. <laughs> So, and, and they're hot and dry too. They're not as hot or as dry, but they, should, they ought to be awful wet as well. The cannibalism model also, just by itself, has a problem of there should be a roof on the caldera, so the magma's down here, alterations up here. What did you do with that two or three kilometers of crust that's missing? But that's for another, another person. Any other questions?